Hello, everyone. I'm Barbara Mantell, and I'm the Health Beat Leader for Freelancing at AHCJ. Uh, this web webinar is one of a series of topic-specific training opportunities to brief healthcare journalists um, on the latest information in particular health areas, or in my case, in freelancing, and to give you ideas and resources that you can use in your work. Today's topic is getting a grant or fellowship to support your in-depth reporting project. Um, in the spring, I led a webinar about breaking into narrative journalism and we touched on funding, but we didn't go into a lot of detail. We all acknowledged during that session that freelance fees that publications pay probably aren't gonna pay for in-depth narrative article or an investigative piece. It's not gonna make it worthwhile to spend the time and energy. And so that's why we're having this webinar today to get into greater detail about how to get additional funding and how to make those applications really compelling. Um, before I introduce the panelists, I'd like to point attendees to the list of fellowships and grants that are up at the freelance portion of the AHCJ website. I've got 18 fellowships or grants listed right now and another seven will be going up, I believe this week. Um, I'd also like to plug AHCJ's own fellowships that support journalism projects. Uh, they include the Reporting Fellowship on Healthcare Performance that supports you in pursuing a significant reporting project related to the U.S. healthcare system at either a local, regional, or national level. HCG also has the International Health Study Fellowship, which is a six-month program supporting mid-career um, U.S.-based healthcare journalists who want to pursue a story or project, comparing a facet of our health system to a health system in another country. Um, all the HCJ fellowships can easily be found on the new and revised HCJ website. So I am thrilled to have our three panelists for today's webinar. Uh, Josh McGee is an investigative reporter for Mindsight News, and he covers the intersection of criminal justice and mental health with an emphasis on public records and data reporting. Um, Thanks he, for having me. Yes? Thanks for having me. Oh, okay. And he is a 2023 and 2024 Carter Center's Mental Health Journalism Fellow, which is a really impressive fellowship. And he'll share what went into writing a winning application. He also has other fellowships as well. Um, Jacqueline Stenson is the manager of projects at the USC Center for Health Journalism. She leads the center's outreach and recruitment for its fellowships and other initiatives. And it offers reporting grants of between two and ten thousand dollars, two thousand and ten ten thousand um, dollars. She's also worked as a health reporter and editor, and she's been published in multiple places: L.A. Times, Reuters, NBC News, Self Shape, and, and more. Um, she and our third panelist will share tips about what they want to see in an application, what makes an application stand out, and some mistakes that they see as well. Uh, Eric Ferrero. Uh, serves as executive director of the Fund for Investigative Journalism. He has worked closely with some of the nation's leading investigative journalists to help them uncover high impact stories, including stories published or broadcast by The New Yorker, 60 Minutes, The Washington Post, The New York Times, PBS Frontline, as well as other outlets. And they give um, out dozens of grants annually, I believe up to $10,000 each. Eric, is that? Yeah, mm -hmm. okay. Um, so welcome, everybody. Uh, our panelists will take just a few minutes to briefly describe the grants and fellowships they give or, in Josh's case, have received, and then we will move into the q and I'll start out with some questions, and then I'll direct audience questions. Please ask questions, uh, everybody who's viewing, and please post your questions in the Q&A window, not the chat window, but the Q&A window. Josh, can we begin with you? Can you briefly explain what resources you get? Um, as a Carter Center Health Journalism Fellow and the project that it's funding? Yeah, so I think the most important part um, is the fee. They give you $10,000 uh, for your project, paid out in two separate payments, so it's not everything up front. Um, for it, they send you down to Emory University, uh, the Carter Center uh, Presidential Library, um, and you get about four days of learning. Um, you you hear from the fellows from the year before and the projects that they were uh, creating, and you also hear from the other people in your class about the projects that they're getting into. 
Um, and after that, she gets a mentor or two mentors to help you. Um, they're chosen specifically to help you with the project that you've pitched. Um, and you have monthly meetings with them uh, to talk about the project. And also there's a there's always a coordinating um, webinar that's on a different topic related to mental health. So all of it's about mental health. They'll give you a couple different uh, subjects and things that might be interesting and intriguing from their long um, their long list of uh, former fellows. Um, and then, you know, I think you asked about my project. Uh, my project's basically a continuation of a, a story I did early when I was at Mindsights that looked at police response to mental health issues. Um, I did it in Chicago and I basically use call log data, um, police calls to determine how often police were going to which neighborhoods for mental health calls. And then I, um, I crossed that data with uh, use of force reports to see how often police knew they were coming into a situation with a mental health aspect and they still use force. So a lot of that was taser usage or sandbags or um, you know, sometimes it's just tackling, uh, but uh, there was still, I think, two shootings. So uh, I looked at that for about 10 years worth of data. Um, but for the project now, I've basically expanded it to uh, the 100 biggest cities is how I pitched it. Um, wow. I, I had already sent a lot of a lot of these FOIAs in before, uh, but, you know, it's now it's producing the story that kind of looks at that. It's, and I do have um, Northwestern Medill's class. Um, their social justice investigative reporting class it helps me out with um, some of the research for that. Thank goodness. <laughs> um, Jacqueline, uh, can you tell us what kind of grants are available for freelance health reporters from the Center for Health Journalism? Yes. Yeah, so hi, everyone. Thanks so much for joining the webinar. And thank you also to the Association of Healthcare Journalists for including me. I'm really happy to be here. We have various programs at the center. Some are for journalists around the country, including the National Fellowship and the Data Fellowship. And then some are just for reporters focused on California, but they are all open to uh, both staff members and to freelancers. Um, and I can tell you some more about some specifics in just a moment, but overall, the first thing I would really like to note is that our programs are not only for the quote unquote health reporter at the paper, although we of course love when health reporters apply, but our programs are open to reporters covering a wide range of health and social welfare issues. So we get applications from uh, general reporters, as well as those who cover topics like homelessness, environment and climate change, race and gender issues, education, and more. And we embrace a very broad view of health at the center. And we know health doesn't just happen at doctor's offices and hospitals. It's shaped by our environment, our schools, our neighborhoods, and our communities. And we strive to admit fellows whose work reflects that. And woven through all of our work is a focus on how systemic inequities can shape life outcomes. So most of our programs are five months in length, and they include mentorship, professional training, and financial support for reporting projects. So our grants start at 2000, and in many of the programs, they can go as high as $10,000. And the stipends are meant to defray the extra costs of reporting. They're often used for travel, lodging, and food, or things like purchasing data sets or covering the costs of translating projects into different languages. And we also offer engagement grants of up to $2,000 for community outreach efforts. And we have two engagement editors on staff full-time who are available to work with, to work with you. Um, and because our programs span about half a year, we're looking for narrative projects that go beyond a one-off feature. Oftentimes the fellows in our programs are doing multi-part series, but sometimes they might be doing one long form in-depth magazine piece. It really depends on the project and the media outlet. And my first piece of advice I would have for anyone applying for one of our programs is to really just think about your application like it's a, a query letter to an editor. We have a panel of judges for each program. They're all veteran journalists. And we're looking for all the same elements that your editor is looking for. So a timely topic that you think is important for your readers and why. A news hook, of course, a plan for solid reporting that will support your thesis. We'd like to know what your goals are for the project and how you think it might have impacts in the community. So we ask that you submit both an overall proposal summarizing your project 
And then a step, separate statement of deliverables. And by that, we mean, you know, please tell us what shape your project will take. For instance, will it be a three-part series, print, video, audio? What will each story focus on? And include any multimedia components or sidebars. Um, depending on the program, we also may ask you to submit a budget that tells us how the money, how much money you need and how you plan to use that money for your stories. Um, That's great. Thank you. We'll go into more detail during the hour, I'm sure. Um, Eric, can you describe the grants that are available from the Fund for Investigative Journalism? Sure. Thank you, Barbara. And and thanks also. I'm a huge fan of Josh's work and of the uh, the USC program. So I'm delighted to be here with all of you. And of course, um, AHCJ just does such incredible work for, for the whole field. Um, so the Fund for Investigative Journalism was founded in 1969 to provide support uh, directly to journalists to cover the expenses of investigative stories. And so the grants that we have available right now, I'm going to talk mainly about sort of our regular full grants, and I'll talk about a couple of smaller programs too. But the the main grant program uh, that we have available is um, for investigative stories on any topic in any medium. So they can be traditional news, they can be podcast, book, documentary, uh, the full range. Um, they're up to $10,000, as Barbara mentioned, uh, per story or project. Um, we have three, uh, three cycles a year for these regular full grants that we do. The next deadline is January 29th. So it's, it's very timely to be working on those right now. When you come to us for a grant, uh, if you're a freelancer and about two thirds of our grantees are freelance journalists, if you're a freelancer, you need to have at least one letter of commitment from a media outlet committing to run the story. Um, and we have a sample letter on our website uh, along with our application materials and that's FIJ.org. And that sample letter makes clear, it's, it's not an ironclad thing. There are plenty of caveats there for the outlet. They can say that they intend to run it provided it meets their standards and is as described, but you do have to have that letter to be eligible. In terms of what expenses can be part of that grant, which is again up to ten thousand uh, dollars, it is is really quite a wide range of expenses that uh, that are related to that investigation. So uh, typically, it's open records fees, travel. Uh, it can be your time, uh, and you calculate your own rate. You tell us either you know hourly rate or stipend, how you kind of calculated your time. Um, some of our applicants come with proposals that include subcontracting for research assistance, data visualization, that kind of thing. That can all be part of the grant as well. Um, so again, the next deadline for those is at the end of January, January 29th. You get a decision six or seven weeks later. The way we pay the grants is that you get half of that grant up front right away once you're uh, once you're awarded the grant and the other half once the story publishes or if it's a series when the first piece in a series publishes. The last thing I'll mention for now, because I know that we'll do uh, tips and other stuff later, Barbara, um, is uh, in terms of kind of how we uh, how we think of, of investigative reporting or kind of how that's defined, what's included in that description because I know different folks define that differently. For us, that means that it's a story that is uh, uncovering wrongdoing or injustice that was previously unknown or previously hidden. So for example, a story just about the nature of long COVID or the existence of long COVID wouldn't be investigative for us, no matter how much you're digging to tell it. A story about how, um, uh, schools or insurance companies or uh, employers, governments are not equipped to deal with long COVID or about how they're not uh, sufficiently covering people with long COVID symptoms and that there's some kind of a systemic problem there. That would absolutely be something we'd be interested in funding. And we can get more into examples 
but that's how we define investigative. And, a, and I don't have a percentage, but a tremendous number of the grants that we do um, are for stories that are related to healthcare. Last year, I should say this year that we're ending in 2023, uh, we made 120 new grants for 120 new investigative uh, projects around the country. Our work is US focused. Those grants were in 44 states. Most of those stories are state and local stories with a national contour to them, but a lot of them get into um, access to health care, insurance issues, uh, hospitals being equipped to deal with new issues or with patients, prison health care systems, all kinds of different health care stories that are investigative that we're eager to support. Thank you so much. Those descriptions are very helpful. I want to remind viewers to please ask questions and to type them in the Q&A window. I, I'm not going to be opening the chat window. I'll start with a few of my own. We do have audience questions coming in, and they're really good. Um, but I want to start with an open-ended question. Jacqueline and Eric, uh, could you just give maybe your top two pieces of advice for writing a compelling application? Um, I think, yeah, my top bit of advice is, um, you know, we have different grant and fellowship opportunities and they each have slightly different themes. So I would recommend um, taking a look at our fellowships and grants page, which I just put in the chat and, um, you know, tailoring your pitch, you know, making sure it fits within the themes of our fellowships. And then when you submit it, really think of us as editors because we have a panel of judges who review all of the applications. Um, I'm one of them. I'm My background is in journalism. I've also taught journalism for many years. Everyone on our panel is a journalist. So think of us as editors and, and really just pitch us like you would an editor. And then um, I also recommend um, for folks applying to meet with me. I do one-on-one -on -one consultations all the time with journalists. And it's really a great opportunity to just, you know, make sure that we're, you know, you're, that we're on the same page, that you're applying for a program that really fits within um, your goals and your timeline, because sometimes we have programs that require folks to be on the USC campus, and if you're not available that week, then that program obviously is not a good fit, but I'm happy to talk with folks anytime and try to find a program that's a good fit. Eric? That's great. I agree with all of that. Uh, two additional tips. For us, one is um, uh, be sure to have initial findings and share them in your proposal. How do you know that there's a story there? They shouldn't be totally speculative when you come to us for a grant. You should have done some initial legwork, have some initial findings that you can lay out in that proposal that shows us that there's a story there. And then the rest of your proposal walks through how you're going to really build on that and go out and get the rest of it. So that's one tip. Uh, the second one for us is to really draw bright lights to what makes this an investigative project um, and just be very, very clear and explicit and direct about why this is investigative. We get a lot of proposals for really interesting explanatory journalism uh, in particular that we pass on because it doesn't meet our bar of being investigative. You can see on our website, FIJ.org, how we define investigative journalism. You can see examples of stories that we have supported. And, and in that proposal, you just wanna really point to why it's investigative and what you've already got. Quick question, Eric. If someone has applied for a grant in the past to you and didn't get it, um, would they be able to call you up and say, could you tell me what was wrong with my, my application? Yeah, absolutely. Um, I, I prefer those calls, as Jacqueline just said, on the front end, so that I'm not explaining why you got declined, but I'm instead helping you get a proposal that's going to get accepted. Um, but for us, the easiest way to do that is if you email grants at FIJ.org um, and let us know that you have a proposal that you want to talk about we will gladly find time to do that. But yeah, absolutely, Barbara. After the fact, too, I'm always happy to do that. And there's uh, always quite a number. Like Jacqueline, we have a, a board of, of journalists that reviews everything and, and votes on which ones to fund. 
Um, there's always a number of them coming out of those board meetings who we actually hope will retool and resubmit the proposal. And so I often work with folks also on, on that process. Perfect. Josh, uh, this is of particular interest to freelancers who, before they get the, pay, the article published or get a grant, any work they do is uncompensated. How much reporting did you do on your story idea before you applied for the Carter Center grant? Now, I know thinking about it, this is a continuation of a past project. So I'm not sure it's a really fair question for you, but what do you think about how much reporting and interviewing reporters need to do to in an application like this before you know before they apply i think um you know i like to i feel like you're always if you're reporting you're always got these stories that you never completely finish that you kind of dig into um and you might just kind of have a collection of documents so i do like to go from something that i've already done that I'm, i know that i'm interested in so that kind of gives me a little bit extra push um, you know, when I start reporting, I usually am sending public records requests anyway. Um, so that data is usually gathered kind of on the front end. So kind of exploring that data, you know, hopefully being able to do a quick pivot table uh, where you're not going or exasperating your time. Um, I think that that really helps. And I definitely like to have either to have spoken to someone, either an expert or uh, a person involved, or I know that could be a good topic for it. Um, but I think that, you know, that's just kind of front end reporting. That's only going to give you the first kind of 600 words of what you're doing. Um, and if you don't get the fellowship, I, I feel like you probably, especially if you're relooking at this with fresh eyes, you probably could pitch this somewhere else or find the right organization. Um, so I, I do think that you you need a little bit of reporting, but it's it's kind of that front end of reporting of how could you turn in a pitch if you didn't know or have some kind of particular findings. Um, I know that some editors will work with you, uh, but usually grants or fellowships are expecting you to be come in with a little bit of expertise on, on what you're trying to pitch. Eric, how much preparatory reporting and interviewing do you expect to see? on an application? You know, it, it it's a great question. And, and I, I think Josh's answer is perfect in terms of sort of what uh, what folks should expect to do. For it, it, It's hard to answer that, Barbara, because it varies story to story, depending on what it is. But I do want to say, I, I mentioned earlier that we had some other kind of smaller grant programs that I could touch on. And one of them that we started just last year is a um, a new type of grant that we call seed grants that are actually for that early reporting and are only for freelancers. And so these are grants that are up to $2,500. You don't have to have a commitment letter yet. You don't have to have findings yet. These are grants for, I have a really interesting idea and I need to a little bit of resource to go out and do that really preliminary reporting to see if there's a story there and to help shape what, what this investigation might look like. And so that up to $2,500 can include your time. Again, uh, it can also include like an initial reporting trip, a few initial records requests, that kind of thing. Um, it's a shorter application because it's, you know, smaller and simpler. Uh, we haven't posted yet, but probably next week we'll post that the first deadline of 2024 for those seed grants will probably be about the first week of February. So keep an eye out for that at FIJ.org. If you if you don't already receive um, our emails, you can sign up at FIJ.org for our email list and we send out all of our grant deadlines and announcements of new grants and stuff to that list. I didn't know about those seed grants. That's terrific. Yeah, we're really excited. We did 42 of them last year, and they're really, it's a great new way to yeah. get some of that early support, especially again, freelancers that don't have, as you guys were just saying, that have to otherwise do that work kind of, you know, at their own cost. Um, it's a way to get support for that early reporting. Um, Jacqueline, uh, do you expect to see a lot of reporting and interviews done and completed ahead of time. And one of uh, our viewers is asking, um, do you, are you open to um, receiving applications of stories that they've reported and written and finished, but have not been published? Um, so, so first off, I mean, we don't expect people to have done tons of actual interviews, but we are 
we do want to know that they've done enough reporting to know that they are on the right track and they have a, a, a solid project in hand. And I have conversations with folks to kind of go through that. And I find that most of the time folks have done a fair amount of work. They know they're, they've they been covering something and this idea has come up to them and it's just something they want to pursue and they're already kind of digging into it. So, um, so overall, I you know, I would say, you know, have enough information that we know it's a solid project and, you know, we can talk through that. We do have a data fellowship that happens every October. That one's a little more detailed for us because uh, we require that all the fellows in our programs do a data-driven project. So it's a little more complicated. So what we do for that one is uh, we actually do ask that folks meet with me initially, and then I put them in touch with a data journalist. We have several um, leading data journalists in the country who teach and mentor in our program. So I refer journalists after I've talked with them to have a separate consultation with a data journalist to kind of talk through, um, is do we think the data is out there? Um, is there a reasonable chance the data is out there? What kinds of hurdles are we gonna, going to encounter? Because all of those projects are data driven. So we really wanna make sure that they work out before folks come into the program. So um, yeah, we do as much upfront as we can because we want the, the applications to come in strong. I mean, our whole point is, you know, with the center is to support uh, professional journalists. So we are here to, to do that with the mentoring and the training and the funding and all that. Um, so um, I'm happy to answer any questions if folks want those. Um, if people have already done a story and they haven't published it, um, so, I suppose technically, yeah, they could come into one of our programs. Um, they would need to find an outlet to publish that project. So um, if people, if freelancers, and I encounter this fairly often, freelancers will come to me, they'll say, I have this idea that I'm working on. I, I don't have an outlet lined up yet. So I say, okay, well, let's start the process here. Let's try to get your application in, start pitching different outlets, and then keep me posted. If it's a little bit past the deadline, you know, I can try to work with you as much as I can until the very last minute when we're finalizing the, the fellows and the grantees. Um, but we do, I mean, our goal in our programs is that uh, participants will, you know, aim to publish their project by the end of like six months from the time they come into the program. So, um, so we are looking for them to, to line up an outlet, but I, I work with folks on that. Okay, that's good to know. Josh, uh, when you were applying to the Carter Center Mental Health Application uh, Mental Health Journalism Fellowship, did you reach out to previous winners? Did you ask to see successful applications? Um, I reached out to Hannah Faparo, who was a who was in the class before me. I know she does a lot of things at AHCJ, um, but I had never spoken to her before in my life. Uh, but I reached out to her via Twitter, um, and she was super eager to pick up the phone and talk to me. Um, I think it was, I think you should do it for every single fellowship. I think it kind of tells you if the fellowship is worth it, is if someone from the class before is eager to talk or eager to to recommend it or try to help you. Um, but if, the, you know, if you if you get a grant and it helps you and builds your career, you're, you're usually going to want to help the next person, help them up, and you feel like it's your duty. Um, so I think it was very helpful. I asked um, about kind of juggling projects and a beat. Um, I think she was doing two fellowships at the same time. Uh, so how how hard that was. Um, she works uh, a regular beat like me. So it was good to know like, okay, well, I'm, I was going to pitch some of these projects. Uh, so basically I just got to continue to work and it really kind of helped me. So I think that um, just talking about a plan and understanding uh, what you're going to get out of the fellowship too. Um, I think it's kind of hard to read the FAQs and know everything you're really going to get out of it. So, um, you know, you really kind of have to cater um, your essay and some of the answers to the questions to what you expect to get out of there. Um, so by knowing, oh, you're going to get this training or you're going to learn about this, or you might need a, the guidelines on how to speak about mental health. Um, you know, you can add that into your application as something that the people who are reading it know that they can actually give you. Um, so I think that that's kind of part of why you should talk to the people. That's okay. That's great. Um, Jacqueline and Eric, is there any way for applicants to see a successful past application? Like, could I call and say, can you show me the application from someone who got a fellowship? 
probably do that. I That's the first time anyone's ever asked me for that. So I don't have one prepared, but yeah, I'm happy to, um, to talk with folks about that and, and, and potentially dig up some some examples of of uh, really strong applications. Okay, Eric. Um, yeah, same. I mean, I think one of the challenges is uh, obviously you know people who wrote those proposals and stuff need to give their permission for that. It's a whole set of kind of other questions there. But I I, I often think as as Jacqueline and I both said earlier, I often think that that time is better spent sort of talking with us about your project, reaching out to have those conversations. You know, we, and I know folks at the other organizations that provide grants and fellowships are usually very eager to talk to applicants and help shape proposals. The, the kind of, I think often sort of one of the most misunderstood things is that dynamic between journalists and funders and kind of this perception that there's like a limited resource that we're sort of holding over here and don't necessarily want to give out or are super selective in giving out. Of course, we're selective and want to give funding to, to projects that meet our bar. But the reality is every organization that provides funding to journalists wants to get that funding into the hands of reporters that can do good work. And so we want to work with you on crafting proposals that are going to um, lead to good stories and that are going to get funded. Um, and and I always encourage people to reach out to us and the other groups to to talk that through. Josh, did you have someone you you have several fellowships? Um, I forget the name of the other one you told me that you had. Maynard Institute fellow. Maynard what Institute. is it called again? Maynard Institute Fellow, it's M200. Um, it's a diversity and investigative reporting fellowship that's really good. Okay. Um, we're going to have to put that up on the HCJ website. Uh, did you have someone for the applications uh, read over your applications when they were done? Did your editor or um, yes, so or another reporter? My, my editor is a, he was a previous Carter Fellow fellow so he was uh, big on having me apply um, but he definitely looked over my um, my whole everything I turned in the application um, I think that some of the applications are like google sheets and there'll be multiple pages um, so I definitely copy and paste the whole application before I go in there on a separate google sheet um, so that I can be looking at the questions um, I usually, you know, I, if I'm planning for a fellowship, I'm thinking about it months and ahead of time. Um, so I have it on my calendar for times to check in and keep looking at the questions to kind of think about how to formulate them better. But yeah, but I'm never turning, I'm not going to turn anything because I wouldn't have anyone, you wouldn't post any of my stories without an editor checking over it thoroughly. So I'm not going to turn it in for another professional and not have him look over it or someone look over it at least to so you, to catch the dumb mistakes along with to help you formulate uh, even, you know, how would you pitch this to an editor? I think that that's kind of an important part of the story is you need to pitch this like you're pitching to an editor who would want to receive this and believe that you could finish it. Um, so it's good to have an editor or someone who, who reviews pitches uh, take a look. Now, you said you work on these applications for months. Um, Eric and Jacqueline, um, do I assume you recommend people spend a lot of time on the applications? Are people, uh, is there any advantage to getting your application in ahead of the deadline? So for ours, actually, and, and again, ours, you know, the, is a little bit different than some of the fellowship programs and, and some of the more in-depth things. But for, for the grants we provide for specific stories and projects, we actually don't think that should take somebody more than 90 minutes or two hours to do uh, to do that proposal. And we try to keep it that way. So every time we kind of each year, we sit down and kind of relook at our application process and the form and all the rest of it. And if we're adding stuff to it, we're also trying to subtract stuff from it so that we keep it. And again, that's largely because um, we know that most of the people applying for grants from us are freelance journalists who are taking time away from other projects to do the application. I think that a that a fellowship program is different, and and Jacqueline can talk about um, 
theirs. I will say, I often encourage people to, to repurpose, you know, pitch letters, pitch memos, editorial memos, other pieces. You shouldn't be starting from scratch when you're writing that proposal. You probably have written this in different ways, but you should be repurposing it. There are times that we get folks who will apply uh, and I can look at it and know just from the wording, oh, this is the proposal they used for Solutions Journalism Network because it's all full of solutions language. And that's wonderful. We love that organization and partner with them in various ways. That's not what we fund. And so there's a difference between kind of, I don't want you to start from scratch. You should repurpose it, but you should repurpose and tailor it for us or for whoever you're applying from. Yeah, and we use Google Forms as well. And we also are not expecting when folks submit like their overall, the summary of their proposal, we're not asking for like five pages. I mean, we're really asking for like one succinct page to sum up, you know, we have a, a strong idea of what project you're undertaking, why it's timely, why this is important, what impacts you think this could have in your community. Um, so yeah, we're not asking for like super long um, applications either. Um, we have both fellowships and what we call impact funds. So for us, the and all of our programs are similar in that they have the mentorship and the, the funding and that kind of thing. But our fellowships involve a week at USC um, where folks come out and actually, and we pay for that. Um, and they spend a week on campus and we have speakers in the, the medical and public health field. We have journalists come in. We talk about all, all things health and journalism. And um, so when I talk with folks, you know, I often am talking to them months ahead, not that they're necessarily spending months on their application, but just in terms of the timing and the program. So like we have our national fellowship in June, our data fellowship in October. We also have programs specifically for California journalists, like our California fellowship is coming up next March. That one involves a week on campus. So um, for folks who don't want to come to USC for the training or can't because of what, whatever time commitments they have, um, we also have various programs that are done virtually. We call them impact funds. We have one for California. We have um, a domestic violence uh, reporting fund coming up next spring and one called the impact fund for reporting on health equity and health systems, which looks at systemic racism in healthcare. And some of those programs are done remotely. So when I'm asking folks to kind of plan ahead, it's more for us to think about like their timeline, their projects, um, and what really works best for them. Um, and then after that, the applications can be kind of um, hopefully not taking like tons and tons of time as we've been discussing. Um, one viewer asked, um, is it allowable to pair multiple fellowships or grants for a single project, get funding from you and someone else and someone else and combine it? Or do you expect to be the only funder of a story? We allow that. Um, we just ask with our um, programs, one of the things that we ask um, journalists to include in their, their final stories or their scripts is to just make reference to the fact that their project was funded through the USC Center for Health Journalism. And we have different types of language that folks can use that we suggest, but just to give give us an, um, some attribution. But we do not mind if they're participating in other programs as well, if that works for them. Eric? Yep, same here on both counts. Totally fine to have multiple funders. And we also uh, ask for a credit line when stories run. Okay. Josh, um, uh, when you've applied for fellowships, have you done that? Have you tried to line up multiple fellowships for one project? Um, I don't usually try to do the same project. Um, I try to think of, you know, what am I going to get out of the fellowship or the grants, how this training kind of connects. Um, so for me, uh, the Carter Fellowship, I was new to the mental health beat. I've done criminal justice work for a long time. Uh, so I really just wanted some help with mental health uh, sources and knowing what to do. Um, so that's why I paired it with another, the Maynard, which is investigative, um, just to kind of combine some more knowledge and in investigative reporting with mental health reporting. Um, the Maynard doesn't um, necessarily have a project connected to it. It's more about career growth. 
Um, so that's why I thought, you know, it's okay to kind of pair these uh, fellowships together because I'm working towards my job and uh, making myself better, uh, but also for my career and what I'm going to do going forward. So, you know, I think it's pretty important if you're going to take time out of your life to to go to one of these fellowships or grants uh, to kind of work it into your, your career plan. Um, so that's just how I thought about it. Okay. Um, Jacqueline and Eric, do do you favor journalists who clearly have experience in the topic that they're proposing? What And what advice do you offer newer journalists who maybe have a proposal in an area that they haven't really uh, reported on before? We work with journalists at all levels. Um, we do not accept students into our programs, but we accept any uh, US-based journalist um, and folks who are writing for US-based publications. So those are our, our, our basic requirements. Um, we accept people who are um, young reporters who are just starting out as well as like veteran journalists who we even have a, you know, people who've won Pulitzer Prizes in our program. So it's really intended for all levels. And we are um, always looking for diversity and a range of, um, you know, a range of media outlets. So from big uh, national publications to smaller ethnic media, um, we are looking for all of that in our programs. Okay. Um, Eric, I think this is a question for you. Uh, one of the viewers is asking, how do data journalism and investigative journalism significantly differ from each other? Uh, I, th I think they're trying to figure out maybe how to tailor a story or which direction to go. Um, so can you answer that one? Yeah, and they might have been out. I know Jacqueline mentioned earlier that they have a special kind of data track. They might have been asking also about those programs and how they're different. I'm happy to answer first for us. And, and then if it was about that program, you might want to weigh in too, Jacqueline. But um, uh, how do they differ? Uh, sometimes they don't differ, right? I mean, I think, you know, Josh was describing some of the great work that he's doing that's investigative journalism with very, very heavy data. Um, a lot of the grants that we make have a data component to the story, but certainly not all of them. Um, if you do have a data component to your project, when you come to us with the proposal, again, you're going to want to have some kind of an initial finding. So there's some, you know, it, it's not entirely speculative, but you're also going to really want to share in that proposal some of the real details of what your data methodology is going to be. Um, because if you're bringing us a data, a, a proposal that's heavy and relies heavily on data in the investigation, we're going to really kick the tires. And those are the proposals that often I'll come back to applicants with questions before we reach a decision. And we'll go through sometimes a few rounds of revisions and kind of going deeper on what exactly are the data sets that you're hoping and intending to get? What reason do you have to believe to believe they're gettable? What's your methodology for both collecting and analyzing that data? Like we really kick the tires on those data stories. But you know, as as you all know already, some of the strongest investigative journalism has those strong data components to it. So we welcome them. They're just they're you need to really dig into the methodology when you're sharing that with us. Jacqueline, do you want to talk about your programs there? Yeah, I would echo all of Eric's comments. In our data journalism program, um, we actually, you, you don't have to ever have done data journalism in the past, but if you have, that's great too, because we have three tracks. So we um, ask applicants, where are you with your skills now? And what do you want to learn? Or what do you, you know, what, talk with us about it. Um, we have a beginner and intermediate and an advanced track. So folks come in and they are taught at whatever level we meet you where you're at and you learn and you do a data-driven project um, with the skills that you've learned, you've learned through the fellowship. So if you've never done data journalism, it's, um, and you're a little terrified of it, uh, please talk with me because we do have opportunities. You don't have to have had experience 
to participate in our program, but we do want you to, to talk with us to get a solid idea that we, we think, you know, has a, that, that we'll publish by the end of the program. So we, we help you every step of the way. Okay. Um, can people who are not U.S. based apply? Uh, and Josh, in your experience looking at different fellowships, do you find requirements that you have to be a U.S. based journalist? Um, I think for some, but um, a lot of them, the Carter Center has like there you have a bunch of different countries for theirs: um, Ireland, Qatar, um, United Arab Emirates. Uh, so I, th I think it kind of depends on um, the grant or fellowship you're going for. I think that some of them are, you know, for wherever they got the money from, they might have to ensure that you can work in the United States. I think that's one of the, the big questions. But, you know, I've never been I'm not I'm always in Chicago, so I don't, I don't know much about that. <laughs> it's... OK, uh, Eric and Jacqueline, yeah. do you require are, are your grants and fellowships only for U.S. based reporters? For us, um, effectively, yes. There's a little narrow kind of, um, you know, if, if something is international and you're not based in the U.S., it has to have a very strong U.S. angle and still be published in a U.S. outlet in English. And there's this little narrow room, but effectively, uh, you have to be U.S. based is is what it adds up to. And there are some great, you know, Pulitzer Center, Alicia Patterson Foundation, IWMF. There are some great groups out there that provide funding for journalists who are working outside of the U.S. too. Okay, Jacqueline? Yeah, our programs, um, you do have to be a U.S.-based journalist, but your projects do not have to be written in English. So they could be written in Spanish or Chinese or any any language as long as the um, publication has um, primarily a U.S.-based audience. Okay, um, I'm gonna try to share my screen. I've never done this before. So hopefully, let's see, I hit share. Uh, okay, it's too complicated. I'm not gonna do it. But anyway, I really highly recommend going to the Freelance Center at the new AHCJ website where I have awards listed. I have fellowships listed. Um, more are gonna be added this week. Oh, Catherine did it, okay. So if you scroll down this page, you'll see all the awards, all the fellowships. And thank you, our producer of the web webinar who's doing this. There you go. Okay. That's a great resource, Barbara. That's wonderful. And there, I just found out in the Q&A from one of our viewers, like five more that I need to add. I also have seven on the list that our webinar editor is going to be adding this week. So I'm constantly adding and, and sometimes, unfortunately, taking away. Um, one thing that we haven't discussed, but I think we should, is uh, mistakes that you see. Uh, so I'm wondering, Eric, if you want to uh, take that question first, what are some of the common mistakes that you see on applications? It, it sounds like Mm. One I can think of right away that you've mentioned is pitching explanatory journalism rather than investigative journalism. Is there some other mistake that's common? Yeah, and and I, I think Josh mentioned earlier, and it bears repeating, the, the, the very simple mistakes that happen when you're the only person looking at your work, whether it's a proposal or anything else, um, it really helps to get that extra set of eyes that he was talking about to look at your stuff. And that's for typos that's for whoops i left a different organization's name in there because i was repurposing you know the whole the whole bit we get proposals that still have like track changes comments and them from somebody who was looking at stuff so there's the just sort of like we're all busy we get it but like tidy up tighten up there's that kind of stuff i think more substantively in terms of stuff we've not talked about yet one of the biggest mistakes um that i see you know, we have on our on our application form, we ask you if the story has been covered before. Um, and if so, to please explain. And there's a, a field to explain how your project will advance it, will build on what's already out there. It's um, surprising how many applicants will tell us something has not been covered when it's really easy to see that it has been covered. Um, 
And if you answer that question, I mean, if you don't do a basic Google search yourself, that tells us a lot. If you've done it and you still tell us it hasn't been covered, you're sort of creating an automatic disconnect with reviewers when you do that and kind of putting yourself at a great disadvantage, partly because <clears throat> we're asking that in part, in large part, to give you the opportunity to tell us how you're going to advance that coverage. So if you don't tell us that it's been covered, then you can't tell us how you're going to advance it. And so we both think either you missed it or you're hoping we missed it and we don't know how you're going to advance it. That's one of the most common reasons that proposals get declined um, by us. Okay, so you're not saying that it can't be covered before. You're saying you need to explain how you're going to advance it. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Okay, Jacqueline, would, what would you say would be some of the common mistakes you see in applications? Um, I would agree with the other comments about just general kind of sloppiness or typos. Um, you know, like, or people, you know, an application that looks like it was submitted to something else and maybe even has another, you know, center's name on it or something like that. So those are things that people can clearly just, you know, take a little more time and go over and clean up the typos and that kind of thing. Um, we are very willing to work with people though. Um, like if, if an application comes in and it looks like, you know, this is really interesting. We have a few questions. We'll go back to folks, you know, sometimes even during the application process and say, hey, you know, we have a few questions. Um, we are very open to that. We're not, you know, it's not like we would rule you out if uh, we go back to you and have questions. That just means we're, we're really trying to make this work. Um, you know, that's our goal is to help folks with their projects. So, um, yeah, I would say um, just please, you know, look over your app, look, give it another set of eyes or have somebody take a look at it because you don't want these little you know, just like any editor, you don't want to turn in something that's a little sloppy and kind of get penalized for that. Um, so maybe just spending a little more time on the okay. copy editing. Josh, can you go into a little bit more detail about the uh, second fellowship that you mentioned that you have? Um, you know, what does it provide and what project it's covering for you? Because I haven't yeah. heard of this fellowship before. So, I've it up on the HCJ website. It's uh, the Maynard Institute. Um, they, they've been developing journalists of color and trying to uh, create more investigative journalists of color for decades now. Um, for it, uh, we flew to Fort Worth, Texas, um, and we spent a really, a really good four days learning and being kind of, you know, emaciated in investigative journalism. Um, we had really good speakers, um, Ron Nixon, some of the best investigative reporters <laughs> in the world and people of color uh, just talking to you about this work and why it's important. Um, I think it's a real good career builder. Um, I see we have a Maynard Fellow in our, our, our attendee list, uh, but you know, I think it's really good for people of color who may have, um, who, who are trying to transition into investigative journalism. Um, I know one of the questions was about age. Uh, this was a fellowship where I felt like, you know, there's people of all different ages and kind of talents in there. Um, but, you know, they were all kind of centered on a focus of maybe being overlooked or stuck in a, a deadbeat beat where they were trying to kind of expand. So it's really a, a good opportunity to just just fall in love with investigative journalism, but also get support. Um, they have a mentor, too. And I think that the, their mentor program is a lot more intense than some of the other because the, the the people they have as mentors really want you to to advance your career and they want to help you. Um, so I do think that's one of the best takeaways from it is, you know, along with having an amazing class of people, we got a um, WhatsApp where we're talking and constantly sharing our stories with each other. Uh, it's a good community to have. So that's one of the a great takeaway from it. Um, this is a question for anybody, but do you recommend in the application stressing not only how the money is going to help you do your reporting, but uh, how usually mentoring or something is provided along with it, but how that's going to help you sort of grow as a journalist or um, help you learn. Is, is that something that's important to stress in applications? 
I think that's one of the most important parts is kind of selling how this is going to advance your career. Um, people, the people who are offering the grants and fellowships, they want to brag about you. They want to say on Twitter that you did this, that you completed this project. Um, so just putting in there what your plan is and that you have a plan and what you plan to do next with the things that you're taught. Um, I think that really helps them kind of invest in you and your story um, to kind of push you ahead and, you know, to advance the, the fellowship and grants that they have. Jacqueline or Eric, do you want to add to that? Yeah, we have a part of our application that asks for just a short personal statement. So tell us about yourself and why, you, why you're interested in the program. So yes, we love to hear what people are hoping to get out of it because uh, we that you know we want to try to meet those needs. So we we love to hear from folks about their goals and kind of where they are in their careers and what they're what they're hoping to achieve. So tell a story about yourself in a way would be helpful. It's just um yeah, so we have you know, we ask folks to submit a resume, but then we also have a section which which is just a short personal statement, like just to kind of summarize about yourself and and that's where you have an opportunity to tell us, um, you know, maybe why you're interested in this particular project or why you're interested in this fellowship, um, what you're hoping to get out of it. So we we love to read those. Eric, do you, Eric, do you want to hear a lot of personal stuff? <laughs> we don't. We don't not want to hear it. I do think it's more relevant for fellowships than it is for kind of story grants like what we do, where we're really looking more at. Is this a solid story? Does this person have the plan and the chops to go out and do it? And that might be, we provide grants to the question earlier, you know, over this last year, we've had grants that have gone to people who are still in still in school and to an 80 year old retired journalist and everybody in between. So the experience level varies a lot, but we are looking at, is this going to be a strong investigation that's going to be you know, revelatory and uncover something new that'll have an impact once it runs. Does this person have a plan to do it and the chops to do it? And I, I think the fellowships are more geared toward, and what are you going to gain from this? How is this building your career? It's not that we aren't interested in that. Of course we are, but I would say the emphasis of that is a little bit less when it's a, a project grant than it is for a fellowship. A fellowship that probably includes mentoring and sessions and right okay um do most um grants and fellowships that you're familiar with and the, the money part of it is that mostly just going to defer expenses or is it also to augment the pretty small fee that freelancers often get um yeah i'll take this one first because it's a real uh, a real bugaboo and a real um a real issue that I think is so important that we talk about differently. Uh, we believe and have believed for 54 years that the journalist time is an expense of the investigation. And so the this idea that you have like your time and then you have the expenses to do your investigative work, those aren't separate. And so our grants cover the expenses of the investigation, which includes and often, in fact, the time is the biggest expense for a lot of our freelance grantees who are doing these things. Um, and then, you know, there are always the other expenses too, the, the kind of hard expenses. But I think it's very, very important that we think about journalist time being an expense of the investigation and that we think about funding being one of the tools an investigative reporters need. I we I also get very um, exercised by these conferences that are about sort of tools for investigative reporters, and there's no session on how to get funding to do the work because right. the funding is one of the biggest tools that you need, right? In addition oh. to the legal help and the mentoring and the training and the this and the that. So we I'm have to think have about to wrap that. up. Unfortunately, I think we have a few more questions, but I think also we wanted to put up on the screen. Uh, AHCJ's own fellowship opportunities. That's on a separate page on the AHCJ website, um, but there's plenty of them. And uh, I also wanted to absolutely thank our viewers and thank the panelists. Um, and I wanted to remind viewers that we have more webinars coming up, one on January 10th on long COVID. Um, and I'm gonna make sure I have everything. Uh,
And uh, yeah, I just wanted to thank everybody for sharing your expertise. And uh, all the viewers out there, I hope you found it useful. Please visit the HCJ website. We have a lot of information about fellowships, our own and outside ones up there, and more will be coming. So uh, good luck with your stories and thank you. Thanks everybody.